Welcome to Driving the Line, the pursuit of safety, where we talk about the real issues out on the road, focus on safe driving, and learn industry best practices from your hosts, Kenny Ray, Mike Bohan, and Jim Seibert, in the hopes that by driving the line, we get more drivers home safe and sound. This podcast was made possible by Marsh McLennan Agency. November 25th, 2008. Nine-year-old Erica Forney was riding her bicycle near her Fort Collins, Colorado home. A neighbor who was in a motor vehicle and was distracted by a cell phone was driving on the same street. It's been described that Erica was just 15 pedals from her front door when the neighbor, who again was distracted on a cell phone, struck Erica riding on her bicycle. Erica's mom, Shelly Forney, was returning home from a doctor's appointment. As she neared her house, she saw the fire trucks, the police cars, the ambulance. The street was blocked, and she got out of her car and began running toward her home, not sure what had happened. And as she wove her way through the fire trucks, blocking her city street, she saw her nine-year-old daughter, Erica, laying there on the pavement. Erica was transported to a local hospital, but two days later, a severe brain injury On Thanksgiving Day, 2008, nine-year-old Erica Forney died. Now, the loss of a child brings an indescribable hurt to a parent. Many parents who lose a child become despondent. They become withdrawn. Shelly Forney had a different reaction. She decided she wanted to honor the life of her precious daughter, Erica, and she became an advocate to bring awareness to the problem of distracted driving in our country. Shelly, to this day, is a speaker. She goes everywhere she can and and to as many audiences she can and tells her daughter's story, Erica's story. Uh, Shelly has been on the Oprah show. She's appeared on Larry King Live. And in 2010, at the invitation of one of Colorado's U.S. representatives, Shelly Forney addressed a meeting in Washington, D.C., attended by the U.S. Congress. Following that audience, Uh, the United States Congress passed a resolution designating April as National Distracted Driving Awareness Month. And our podcast today is dedicated to bringing awareness to that continuing problem. So here we are 13 years after Erica's death, still telling Erica's story. Uh, This emphasis now has picked up national steam. It is a Uh, very much a focus of the National Safety Council, many of our national and state trucking associations and media outlets. And for us here on Driving the Line, it is our focus for today's episode. This is Kenny Ray. I'm one of the co-hosts along with my two dear friends and colleagues, Mr. Mike Bohan and Mr. Jim Seibert. And uh, we want to share some thoughts with all of you today about uh, distracted driving and, and, and the problems that continues to create uh, for the motoring public across our country and particularly uh, within the U.S. trucking industry. Shelly Forney, I want to I'm going to mention her several times. Um, uh, Shelly is available. Uh, you can reach her on, on uh, various social media. You can reach her on LinkedIn. She's got a Facebook page. She is an incredible speaker. And uh, I don't often recommend uh, things to people because those uh, those recommendations tend to come back sometimes people say oh you recommended that it wasn't so great or it wasn't so hot or it wasn't what you said it was but uh, I can recommend uh, Shelly Forney without reservation if, if you've got a safety event coming up for your drivers you're having a driver safety banquet you're having a a safety conference some of our trucking associations uh, Shelly Forney is an amazing speaker uh, I always reach out to her uh, before I ever tell Erica's story and, and uh, I always want to get her blessing. Plus, I always want to tell her, hey, I'm, I'm going to be involved with speaking at an event or in this case, our podcast. And I reached out to Shelly and I said, hey, I'm going to tell Erica's story. And uh, she gave her blessing for that. And uh, I, I want to I want to make this a little personal now for me. And, and then I'm going to punt to my two esteemed colleagues. but. Uh, many of you know that I'm a retired Texas state trooper, and uh, I, w- I want to give you a, an example about this uh, distracted driving business, particularly as it pertains to the use of cell phones. 
35 years ago when I was a young highway patrolman here in Texas, if I saw a car on the interstate that was driving 15 or 20 miles an hour below the speed limit, and I'm not a gambler, but I could bet you a month's salary that if I stopped that vehicle, it was going to be driven by an intoxicated driver, a drunk driver, we call them in Texas, DWI, driving while intoxicated. So I'm going somewhere with this, so y'all stay with me. So 35 years ago, imagine the late 80s, uh, there was a vehicle on the interstate driving 15 or 20 miles an hour below the speed limit. Highway patrol gets behind it, stops the vehicle, and the majority, the overwhelming majority of the time, the driver was going to be intoxicated. Now, rock it forward to today. Today, when you see a car, a truck, any kind of vehicle driving 15 or 20 miles an hour below the speed limit on a public highway today, uh, and you have an opportunity to safely pass that vehicle, you have an opportunity to get around that vehicle, you have an opportunity to get up beside it and, and safely get around it, invariably you see the person's holding a cell phone. They're looking at a cell phone. Now, my point about that is, 35 years ago, bad driving was attributed to the driver being intoxicated. Today, when we see bad driving, it's attributed to a driver holding a device, and most of the time it's a cell phone in their hand, and they're distracted. But what's interesting about that, the driving effect is the same. It, it, so somebody that's holding a cell phone exhibits the same type of driving ability or inability, whatever you want to call it, as an intoxicated driver did. And what's really interesting, and Mike, I'm fixing to, to, to ask you and Jim to, to share your comments on this. What's really interesting about that phenomenon today is this. If somebody, and I don't do this because I don't want to be responsible for making somebody uh, have a, a, an automobile accident, but a lot of times, a vehicle will run up behind that one that's driving 15 or 20 miles an hour under the speed limit, and they'll flash their lights, they'll honk their horn, they'll do something to get that driver's attention. And what's interesting is the moment that driver puts the cell phone down, their driving returns to normal. They get up to normal speed, they have good lane integrity, their driving is okay. So the 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 the, the interesting point about that is. When they're driving without looking at the cell phone, they're a good driver. They're at least an acceptable driver. And yet when they have the cell phone in their hand and they're distracted by that, their driving very much resembles what an intoxicated driver does. So again, we're, we're going to talk today about uh, distracted driving, share our thoughts, our ideas, our experiences with you. And uh, but Mike just wanted to set the the uh, the stage for why we have National Distracted Driving Awareness Month, uh, and it all started from a mom who wanted to pay tribute to the loss of a child uh, from a tragic tragic accident involving a distracted driver. Yeah, I, Kenny. I'm first and foremost. I, I'm I'm very glad that you reached out to to Shelly Forney and, and that uh, she continues to give her blessing to share Erica's uh, Erica's story and and the impact that that's had uh, when it comes to distracted driving awareness because um, I've never felt the pain of lo losing a child but I sure know folks that I that I admire and, and and that I love that have been through that and I know that's something that's just almost an unbearable pain so I just want to thank her for for allowing us to to just talk about her daughter a little bit there. And when you're talking about um, the distract, I mean, we all travel, all three of us travel a lot. We're on the road quite a bit. And, and what you're talking about, Kenny, when you when you come up on a distracted driver, I see it every every week when I'm on the road and uh, you are 100 percent accurate in, in how that works. I mean, you come up on somebody that's running slow, you get around them and inevitably they're going to pass you again because they're going to get off the phone. They're going to get done with that conversation, whatever's going on and they're going to pass you. But this is something that um, it's so prevalent in our society. And it's not just, I mean, we're, we're addicted to cell phones. Everybody, I guarantee you, I mean, I carry around two. I don't necessarily want to, but I do. I've got my personal phone. I've got a work phone. Um, everybody's got a phone. So when you're talking about the difference between 35 years ago and now, you know, 35 years ago, maybe not everybody was intoxicated when they were driving, but now 
I just about bet that every driver has got a cell phone in the vehicle with them. And it's a temptation that is almost uh, unbearable to most people. And it's, it's one of the most dangerous things you can do. And I, and I, and I know we're talking about distracted driving awareness month, but this is something that I, when I have driver meetings with our clients, this is something I talk about every time I go talk to a group of drivers and I appeal to them. And I, I say, this is not just you, this, I want you to talk to your families about this, talk to your spouse, talk to your kids, because it's something that um, it's, it's a serious problem on our roadways and it has disastrous consequences when, when, when we're out there driving around distracted with these cell phones. And, and one of the things, and Kenny, I've heard you, you teach on this before, and I teach on this different types of distractions. And I just want to bring this up and talk about why cell phone use in a vehicle is so dangerous, but there's, there's, there's four main types of distractions for us as individuals. We've got our manual distraction or our mechanical. That's when we're operating a vehicle, when we're doing something that physically takes our hands off the wheel, right? That's, that's yeah. the manual distraction. So that could be holding a coffee cup, could be holding a cell phone, something that just physically takes your hands off the wheel. Then the second one is a visual distraction. That's something that takes our eyes off of the road. And that could be um, looking at a GPS unit, could be looking at a text, something in in the cab, but there's also distractions outside the cab that are visual distractions, billboards, an accident in oncoming lanes, something that that takes your focus off of the road ahead of you. That's number two. That's the visual distraction. The third one is a cognitive distraction. This is something that just takes your mind off of the task of driving your vehicle. And in this case, you know, in our world, we're talking to truck drivers. And so it's it's taking your mind off of the task of driving that truck that you're in. And this could include talking on a hands-free set. This is something that the FMCSA allows our truck drivers to do. They can have the hands-free set. But if you're having a conversation, it can distract you from what you're doing. And it could also include daydreaming. It could, if you're not in a truck or you got a passenger, it could include talking to a passenger. So that's the cognitive. And then the fourth one is the auditory. So it's if you're listening to something that distracts you from operating the vehicle uh, in a safe manner. And the danger of the cell phone, specifically when it comes to texting while driving, is it hits on three of those main uh, distraction types. Because if you are texting on a cell phone, you've got it in your hand. So you've got a manual or a mechanical distraction. Your hand's not on the wheel. It's visually distracting because you are reading the text that's coming across your cell phone and it's taking your eyes off the road. And then cognitively, you're distracted because you're having a conversation. You're ha whoever you're texting, you're having a conversation with them. So you're not thinking about what's going on ahead of you. You're thinking about that conversation that you're having texting. So it hits three of the main four types of distractions. And it's just deadly. And uh, there was a, uh, and we probably all seen this number, but there was a, a, a study that was sponsored by the FMCSA that said you're 23.2 times more likely to be involved in an accident if you're texting while driving than if you're just focused on the road ahead. And if that number is anywhere close to accurate, that 23.2 times more likely, it's, it's, it's deadly. It's just disastrous when it comes to how distracted you can be with that cell phone. And I know there's all kinds of distractions we can talk about. And I kind of went down the road of, of texting and, and cell phones, but that's one of the major, major problems that we're having right now uh, when it comes to distracted driving, for sure. Mike, I, I think you could make a argument that auditory, uh, you can you can fit all four items um, into the cell phone there as well. When you think in text to text to talk text or talk to text, and how do you feel our employers in the industry and the in the technological advance has pushed us to become so addicted? to be responsive, timely. Do you feel that in, in the push to advance and the speed to keep up with, with uh, multiple industries and in the speed of which we need to deliver, does that increase the opportunity for us to have these instances going down the road? Are we sending the wrong message to our employees when we, we know they're on a trip and we're going to text them, hey, change of plan, change of delivery, change of doc number, sending emails, calling? How does that all tie in uh, with, with what 
the message we're delivering today. Well, first off, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought up that uh, that auditory thing because I've seen commercials that talk about distracted driving and they'll play the sound of an iPhone going off, a, the ding, you know, ding, you know, you hear a message come in, and it is if you're sitting on your couch watching that, you're going to reach for your phone. That's your instinct. You're going to reach for your phone. And it's no different when you're driving a vehicle. Uh, you hear that, you hear that notification come in. And the first thing you're going to do is reach for your phone. And if you don't, now you're sitting there wondering, okay, what was that that just came in on my phone, whether yeah. it's an email or text or whatever. I mean, it, it's, it, it's just our first response. We're just so addicted to these phones. You're just like Pavlov's dog. Your mouth starts watering, you know, when, when, that, when that bell goes off. That's right. And Jim, you bring up something that uh, I, I want to tell you, and I'm going to scrub this story so it won't uh, point to any motor carrier in particular, but um, there was a motor carrier in Houston that had a um, a driver that, that ran a stop sign. There was no doubt about it. The driver ran the stop sign and ended up in a minor collision. No one was hurt. I uh, had some property damage. And this driver had been with this company a long time, and they wanted to salvage the driver. They wanted to keep him. And uh, they asked me to come down and do a root cause analysis and try to figure out why did this happen? There, no, no one questioned the fact that the driver ran a stop sign, but they wanted to know why. And I applied just the basic five why methodology of, of, of causation. And one thing, because they were wanting to keep the driver, they made that driver available for me to talk to. And uh, I asked him just point blank. I said, you know, no one, no one questions the fact you ran a stop sign, but why did you run the stop sign? And he was very upfront. He said, I was answering a text message and which surprised me that he would be that frank about it. And, uh, and so y'all know from doing uh, causation, root cause analysis, five whys, you keep asking why till you figure out what the, the real uh, root causes are. And I said, well, why were you responding to a text? And he said this. He said, we have a policy at our company that every day at, at a set time, and I think it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon when this crash occurred, he said, every day at 2 o'clock, we get our dispatch for the following day. And we have a company policy that if we don't respond to that dispatch within 10 minutes, we go to the bottom of the dispatch board, which means we may not even get a load the next day, or we'll get a load nobody else wants. And he said, so basically, if I don't respond to that text, I may not be able to pay my light bill. I may not be able to buy school clothes for my kids. I may not be able to buy food for supper. And so then we went back to the motor carrier and said, you know what? Yes, your driver ran a stop sign, but y'all set him up for failure because you have a policy and a procedure in place that demands that that driver respond to a text message. And y'all sent it to him while he was driving the truck. And so, you know, Jim, to your question, and I think it's a profound question, how many times because of a system failure uh, through a policy or a procedure, do we set our drivers up for failure by compelling them to either answer a phone on a phone call or to respond to a text or some other electronic message that's sent to them as part of the operations of the motor carrier? And so, you know, in my opinion, and, and, and again, as an old state trooper and, and all three of us are heavily involved in regulatory work, you know, uh, that's an administrative failure on my part. I mean, on the part of that motor carrier. Yes, the driver should not have run a stop sign, but the driver was distracted out of a compulsion to comply with the company policy. And the policy itself was bad. And uh, fortunately, the motor carrier saw it the same way and, and they changed their policy and procedure. But your question, I think if nobody else remembers anything from this podcast, our trucking companies need to go back and say, are we setting our drivers up for failure by compelling them to respond in some way to messages that we're sending out while they're driving that truck? I, I like the way you put that. We're setting them up for failure, Kenny, because I, I had a similar experience. And, and I want to I, I want to illustrate a couple different ways it can happen on the administrative side. Um, Mine was a little bit different in that I was in a driver meeting with this company, had all the drivers there, the operations staff, the owner, everybody in the company was there. And this topic came up, well, you know, I was, I was uh, talking to him about distracted driving and this topic came up and, and had drivers say basically the same thing you just said, well, we're getting our orders, we're getting communication from our operations through text messages. That's how they talk to us. And we're on the road all day. So, you know, if we don't answer those texts, we're, you know, the communication's falling flat. I looked at the owner and he had no idea 
that that was going on. So in that instance, it wasn't, he wasn't making the decision to text these drivers. He just doesn't, he didn't know what was going on right. within his, within his operation staff. So he stopped the meeting right there and credit to him. He got up in front of everybody and he said, we're stop this, this is not happening anymore. We're stopping this right now. We are no longer going to be sending text messages to our drivers. We're going to communicate in this way. Uh, and we're going to set the expectation that we do not want you texting or, or communicating in any way outside of your hand, hands free set while you're operating that truck and so it was it was a good outcome but it just goes to show you there's more to it than just the drivers out there being distracted the the company has to have that culture of this is not acceptable here this is not the way we do things we don't want our drivers distracted we want them as safe as possible when they're out there on the road because we talked about in the very first episode we ever did in this podcast i, I talked about protecting life that's what this value is of safety is protecting life and that's what th that clicked with that owner that day he said no we're going to protect our drivers we're going to protect everybody else out there on the road with our drivers and, and this isn't happening and and it was a good decision on their part um I, I i wish they had seen that prior to that meeting but uh but they made the correction when they did see it for sure but i think that happens all the time i think it i think it happens with a lot of companies and, you know, all three of us know it, it is so easy now for an attorney to subpoena cell phone records. And uh, if a motor carrier is involved in litigation and uh, it comes back and shows that that driver, either immediately before or definitely during the time of a crash, uh, was engaged on that cell phone in some shape, form or fashion, then, then you know, the case is basically over. I, I mean, you don't even have to be a good lawyer to win a case like that. If, if you tell a jury, hey. Ladies and gentlemen, at the time this truck was involved in this crash, this truck driver was on a cell phone. That's all a jury needs to hear. And, uh, you know, it. and you brought up something interesting a while ago, and, and I, I want to make a point about this and get, and get y'all's thoughts. There are other ways to be distracted, and we've all seen it. I've seen men shaving going down the road. I've seen ladies putting on makeup. I haven't seen a man putting on makeup yet, but at some point I probably will see that. But I've seen people reading a newspaper. I've seen people eating. I've seen people uh, using a fingernail clipper and clipping their fingernails. I mean, everything under the sun. But in all honesty, the, the, the number one issue that's confronting us today is cell phones. It's this distraction on cell phones. And I was so glad a while ago when Jim added in the auditory. It's not only just that tone that lets you know, but we see people going down the road watching videos. You, you know, they're FaceTiming on, on a, a, a call. So we're, they're actually interacting, like you said, all four of those distractions, their hands off the wheel, their eyes off the wheel, their mind, their minds off of the road, uh, and they're, they're listening, uh, you know, to, to the cell phone. So the cell phones are really the issue today. And, and, um, you know, when I was a trooper 35 years ago it was right when the national seatbelt law started first coming in and to kind of date, date myself. The very first vehicle I ever owned as a teenager was a 1959 GMC pickup. It didn't have seat belts. It simply wasn't equipped. It didn't come from the factory with them. And now we're to the point where if you get in a vehicle and, and it's, it's second nature now for all of us, but if heaven forbid you forget to put it on or you say, well, I'm just going to move in the driveway. They've made those tones now so obnoxious. You yeah. put it on just to make that stupid bell quit ringing, you know? You're not going to get very far without putting your seat back on in these new vehicles. No. It, it, I mean, you got to be deaf or something if that doesn't bother <laughs> you, you know? But the, the reason I bring that up, the analogy to seat belts is uh, what it took to get us to where we are today on seat belts was the technology that the manufacturers were putting in, like those bells, and enforcement. Uh, we reached a point in the Texas Department of Public Safety, we got a mandate from our state headquarters in Austin. They basically said, we don't care who it is, no exceptions. You stop somebody not wearing a seatbelt, they get a ticket. And uh, once that, and, and still to this day in Texas, we have what we call click it or ticket. Uh, you either put that seatbelt on or you get a ticket. And uh, it, it drove up the use of seatbelts tremendously. And I'm just wondering, and, and mainly, I, you know, Mike, this is uh, speculation on our part, but 
you know, what, what, is it going to take that type of, of uh, combination of both the, the technology to manufacture putting the vehicles and enforcement to get us to the point where we we break away from this pandemic we're in of, see, uh, of, of using cell phones when we're driving? Yeah, I, you know, I think I think so. It, what's interesting, though, you talk about enforcement. I pulled up um, a couple different things the other day when when I was thinking about what we we're going to be talking about today. And you look at all the states that have bans on uh, cell phone usage. And lo and behold, Missouri and Texas are two states that just have partial bans. Um, and then we've got uh, Montana and uh, Arizona that don't that don't have bans. Every other state has bans on cell phone use and, and texting. Um, and we've still got a significant problem. So I think it is going to take enforcement, but I think there's going to have to be um, I think there's going to have to be some technology that's involved in it. But, you know, is uh, kind of bring this back around to talking to 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 our folks as far as truck drivers and and the companies that they work for and the owners out there of these trucking companies it's got to be something inside of you where you're making a decision like i i'm going to make a, a a big boy or a big girl decision here and i am not going to be distracted while i'm driving it's that it's just going to have to be that simple where it's like i'm i know it's dangerous um i know that uh, it can cause problems and most people would say would probably say i've been very lucky over the course of my life because i would i always tell people when i'm doing safety meetings i always go down through the distractions on the list texting talking on cell phone all that stuff and i'll just be honest with them i say at one point or another in my life i've done everything on that list as far as being distracted i'm not proud of it i'm not promoting it other than to say i've done it but i'm trying to make better decisions now and that's what it takes. It takes people saying, no, nope, I'm going to make a decision that, that I'm not going to be distracted. And that's a culture thing within a company. Uh, you can do that just like anything else um, when it comes to safety. Um, you can build that into your culture. And I think it's extremely important. And I've seen companies, you know, talk about what to do, um, even uh, in fleets that I've uh, driven for that, that aren't trucking companies, you know, in the insurance world or in, uh, when I was working for the state. Um, we talked about how to um, keep from being distracted on the road with your phone. And um, I know, I think it was the state of Iowa. They passed out some, uh, it was like a little, little pocket, little foil pocket. You could put your cell phone in and it basically just didn't get any service. So when it sat in the seat beside you, you didn't hear those dings coming in as you're getting text. Um, you know, I talk about turning mine off and, and putting it in a glove box or putting it somewhere where I can't reach it, where I know it's not even a, you know, it, it's it, it's not even an option because I can't reach it even if I wanted to. And it just kind of takes away the temptation of reaching back there. If I I've seen some uh, ag companies with the the zero fatality, zero injury mentality take their safety program to such an extent that leadership or employees are driving. They're going down the road. There'd be a notification or an automatic respond email. I will be driving um, this period of time. I will not be available to text an email. You can call if you need me, but it's hands-free and the policies that your phone is stored in your bag and your trunk or in the back seat, out of hands reach, and you're just unavailable. And there's grace in that. There's grace in Sometimes we have to pull over on the side of the road or we got to pull into a Walmart parking lot and we got to jump on a conference call, which would interrupt our trip or our, our time or our allotment or whatever we had to get to where we were going for a meeting. And it's it comes down to planning and it comes down to notification of others of, of your inability to be responsive uh, in, in certain media needs. And that phone call uh, can be the best. I, Kenny, I'm glad that you uh, brought up the other forms. You know, it, on the farm, it's not uncommon to see the knee driving experts. You know, I'm eating that chili dog from Sonic, or I'm I bought some uh, gas station pizza, and I'm going down the road feeding my face because I don't have time to stop, and that. That gets into the four levels of the distracted driving. You know, we've got the mechanical, we've got a visual. Did I just spill chili on my shirt or did I get it on my leather seats? You name it. So I think that the cell phone, absolutely, it hits all. And that's why it's the main focus and, the, and a main distraction. 
the the noise from the music, the attitude. Have you ever been driving somewhere? It's a routine drive and you get there and you're like, wow, that was a fast trip. Why did that take longer or why did the, why was that shorter than it should have been? Sometimes you just go into a zone and, and you forget what you're doing. Your mind is not on task and your, you know, your eyes are out of focus, that thousand yards there, so to speak. Um, there's many factors that uh, can go into it. So I've read a really interesting book. Um, it's called The Pre-Accident Investigation. It's by Todd Conklin, who gets into the psychology of workplace accidents and, and, and those incidents and, and near misses and reporting and things like that. One of the most profound questions he asks at, at one of his seminars that I watched was, how do you know that you drove safely on your way to work? What's the gauge? If your answer is, well, I'm here, aren't I? Or I arrived safely. If we are judging how we're operating a, a motor vehicle by the end result of I'm here, aren't I? then we're missing everything in the middle. And judging it by the end versus throughout the process, um, it really changed my mind uh, and, and my way of thinking of, I get in, mirrors are adjusted, 10 and 2. Uh, okay, I'm driving here. This is my path. I'm not solely relying on the GPS, the the commercials that say, turn right now, you know, and, oh, I'm going to turn into this lake, you know, yeah, you're the pond. Yeah. Re recalculating, turn left now, recalculating, you turn next intersection. If, if I've got that plan and I, and you know, I pulled out the old Rand McNally ahead of time and I, I know my, uh, my direction and the roads I need to be on and my route of travel, those other distractions can, can be, um, limited. And I can focus on the safe operation of that vehicle. Guys, thank y'all so much for uh, your comments and sharing your experiences. Uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, that, that listen to our podcast, we appreciate y'all joining us today. This is, this is National Distracted Driving Awareness Month. And I know for a fact, because many of you have reached out to me, we've got a lot of trucking company safety directors that listen to this podcast. And I want to challenge you to do something this month to uh, draw attention to your drivers of the significance of this, this month. We've set aside the entire month of April to focus on preventing distracted driving. So all you safety directors out there, let's do something innovative. Let's do something creative. Let's do something that'll make it stick with your drivers to ultimately get them to the point of what Mike just shared that, hey, I'm simply making a choice. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be engaged with that cell phone while I'm driving a vehicle uh, on a public highway in in, uh, in this country. Well, we started off telling you uh, Shelly Forney's story of her precious daughter, Erica. And I mentioned that uh, for those of y'all that would like to contact Shelly about possibly speaking at one of your events or just connecting with her, uh, somebody else like us that is uh, totally committed to safety. You can reach her on LinkedIn. You can uh, find her Facebook page. But the whole idea of social media, and my two co-hosts co will laugh because they'll know that I am the least qualified person on this planet to talk about social media. LinkedIn is the only social media I'm on. Don't even know how to get on Facebook. Never been on Facebook. Uh, but if y any of y'all would like to connect with me, with Kenny Ray on LinkedIn, I'd love for you uh, for you to do that. But Jim, I, I'm going to ask you a pointed question because in my mind, you're, you're kind of the technology guru of our team. Uh, I know there's some other types of social media, possibly even ones that our podcast can be found on some of these platforms and things, but, uh, share. And then, and then Mike, anything you want to add about social media? I just want to give a, an opportunity. If any of our listeners out there would like to connect with us to where you can send us a direct message, an idea, or, or whatever. You, you can get me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you on that. But 
Jim, I want your ideas on social media and, and talk about uh, a few minutes where we where all our podcasts can be found. And then, Mike, anything you want to share on social media, and then we'll wrap this up. Sure thing, Kenny. Let's start with LinkedIn. Uh, you can connect with any three of us and follow other safety leaders who you know are sharing best practices. You're going to see from the three of us that we share the links to these episodes for driving the line, the pursuit of safety, as well as many other updates and changes and trends that we're seeing across the industry. Second, you can describe and listen uh, to our show on any device from any podcast platform of your choice. That includes Google, Spotify, Apple, and, and there's many more. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining us for this episode of Driving the Line. As always, we are the podcast that's constantly in pursuit of safety. And we just want to encourage you, make a personal commitment and do whatever you can to influence others to not drive distracted. And just remember uh, Erica Forney's story, the story of a precious nine-year-old girl whose life was cut short because of a distracted driver and become an advocate like her mom, Shelly Forney, has become. So from all of us here at Driving the Line, uh, we wish you a great day and uh, don't drive distracted. That's all the time we have for this episode of Driving the Line, The Pursuit of Safety. We hope you enjoyed our discussion and thank you for listening. You can rate, review, and subscribe to Driving the Line, The Pursuit of Safety on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any other app you're using. You can also follow Marsh McLennan Agency on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, thanks again for listening. Drive safely, everyone.